the next topic is christian antichrist we need to be very sure that antichrist is going to come from the christian denomination not from outside is not going to be a leader from a gentile world is going to be a leader from the christian world christian antichrist do we know that antichrist is a christian yes we have clear verses in bible let's read 1 john 2:18 and 19 little children it is the last hour and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would not have con- they would have continued with us but they went out that they might be manifest that none of them were of us first john 2:18 it talks about antichrist and it says that the antichrist community the antichrist group they went out from us they went out the antichrist group went outside from the true disciples from the true apostles it's talking about john's group which is the true christians apostle john's group they went out so the anti christian group is actually a christian group and it is a fake christian group let's read through these verses second corinthians chapter 11 verses 14 and 15 and no wonder for satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness those whose end will be according to their works If you look at 2 Corinthians 11:14 it says Satan transforms himself he changes himself and the same keyword transforms themselves it is there in the next verse as well as well Satan comes as an angel of light and 2 Corinthians 11:15 it says his ministers whose ministers Satan's ministers they'll transform themselves into ministers of righteousness what does this mean it means that Satan's apostles will be part of the Christian church probably a fake christian church they'll still be part of the christian church and the antichrist is truly a christian it is established from these verses first john 2:18 and 19 second corinthians 11:14 and 15 let's move on to the next point to to prove that antichrist is always going to come from the christian denomination antichrist is a succession of men not one man for about 1500 years the christian world was simply believing that antichrist is not a one man antichrist is a succession of men all the reformers john calvin martin luther zwingli look at all the reformers writings you can read, you can read only two things one is you need to read bible second is you can read the books of the people who are willing to give their lives for jesus you can't read each and every book you need to read the books of the people who are willing to give their lives for jesus so if you look at the reformers who are willing to who in fact died for jesus many of the reformers died for jesus many of the reformers were willing to lay down their lives for jesus every reformer was of the belief that antichrist is not a single man this false concept of antichrist as a single man is going to come in the future this actually came from the roman catholic church this came from the writings of the roman catholic church i'll prove it in a different topic but as of now how do we know that there are many antichrist antichrist is not a single man let's read matthew 24:5 for many shall come in my name saying i am christ and shall deceive many is jesus talking about one antichrist or multiple antichrist jesus is talking about many antichrist many shall come in my name and they'll say i am christ first john 2:18 let's read this verse Little children it is the last hour and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour Apostle John is talking about many antichrists not one antichrist Jesus talks about many antichrists as Apostle John is talking about many antichrists let's look at Daniel 7:25 He shall speak pompous words against the most high shall persecute the saints of the most high and shall intend to change times and law then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time how long 
the antichrist will persecute the saints of the most high it is for a time times and half a time will persecute the christians true bible believing christians for about a time times and half a time we have already seen this interpretation time it stands for 360 days times stands for 720 days 2 years half a time it's half an year it's 6 months 180 days you add them together it's 1260 days it's not just an ordinary day it's a prophetic day how do we know that it's a prophetic day you can read through the prophets ezekiel 46 let's read this verse and when you have completed them lie again on your right side then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of judah 40 days i have laid on you a day for each year here it says god says i have laid on you a day for each year for the transgression of judah and for the transgression of israel he has laid on ezekiel one day for each year let's look at numbers 1434 according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land 40 days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year namely 40 years and you shall know my rejection for each day you shall bear your guilt one year it's called as a day for a year principle it's there in bible the day for a year principle and even in genesis 5 5 adam's days are 930 years adam's days are these many years genesis 6 3 God says yet his days shall be 120 years man's days will be 120 years and Genesis 25:7 and these are the days of the years of Abraham's life look at the phrase here it's called as the days of the years days of the years one day stands for one year there are plenty of other references you can take this down and refer to it later and there's 1260 days being prophetic days and we need to interpret this as years 1260 years can one antichrist persecute the saints of the most high for about 1260 years not possible because god has limited the age of a man to 120 years it's not possible for a single man to persecute the true christians for about 1260 years it means that it is a succession of antichrists it is a succession of men it is a succession of antichrist many antichrists will come in my name and say that i am christ an antichrist has the spirit of judas we had seen this in the previous topic john 17:12 jesus calls judas iscariot as the son of perdition this phrase this terminology is used only for one other person in bible and it is the antichrist second thessalonians second chapter verse number 3 antichrist is called as the son of perdition we need to understand this concept of son of perdition the spirit of judas will be within antichrist judas was not an opponent judas was not an enemy he was a friend of jesus he was not an accuser of jesus he was a friend he was acting like a friend he was basically a counterfeit he was betraying from inside and the same thing the antichrist will do he will betray from inside he will act as an apostle he will act as a leader of a particular church but he'll betray jesus from within he'll lead people astray from within and that's why second corinthians 11:14 it's very important for every true christian to understand this particular verse satan transforms himself into an angel of light even the next verse is important the ministers of satan they will also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness Let's look at the next point point number 4 man of sin revealed after the falling away the man of sin is revealed after the falling away not before the falling away because there are some wrong teaching saying that uh, he will be revealed uh, uh, before the falling away he has to be revealed after the falling away second thessalonians second chapter verse number 3 let's read this verse let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition and here if you look at the words in bold falling away first first it is a falling away and after that the man of sin got revealed let's look at the true christian church let's look at the history of the church jesus died for us he died for us 
and he rose again in which year 30 AD in that time jesus established the true church and till which year it was acting as the true church till 312 people were ready to give their lives till 312 they were ready to give their lives for jesus and the only thing they were interested in is jesus and bible and 313 king constantinople came and king constantine what he did was he merged the paganism and he merged christianity he stopped the persecution of christians yes he liked jesus he liked jesus but he wanted to keep the control of the entire roman empire he was the ruler of a unified roman empire he was the ruler of the entire europe not just the east not just the west he was the ruler of both the east and the western europe a unified roman empire he merged paganism with the christian the true christian belief and that's when the falling away started the falling away started in 313 as in when the they were trying to name these idols as mary and jesus and peter and paul they named these idols as christian names that's when the falling away started and was the man of sin revealed after that yes 313 church started faltering 538 justinian emperor justinian he gave the papal primacy to the pope he said pope is the leader of all the christians in those days it was not called as catholic those days it was not called as orthodox church or the protestant church it was just one christian church pope became the leader of the entire christian church in 538 ad it's called as a papal primacy and this was declared by emperor justinian and he was immediately revealed after this falling away is from the true christian faith it is not from a gentile faith it's not from a false faith it is a falling away from the true christian faith to an apostate christian state and this falling away can it refer to non christians not possible falling away can only be referred to the christians and when did the church fall away the church started falling away right from 313 onwards as in when idol worship came in the name of paganism and that's when the, the roman catholic church started and uh, this antichrist he is a fake he has the spirit of judas he is a counterfeit he is an outwardly christian person just like it is mentioned in 1 john 2:18 and 2:19 and as it is mentioned in 2 corinthians 11:14 11:15 he is an outwardly fake christian leader and he lead people astray like we see in this picture people think that they are going to church but actually they are going to hell isn't it let's look at the next point his iniquity is mystery he does iniquity he he commits transgressions but he keeps it as a mystery let's read second thessalonians second chapter seventh verse for the mystery of iniquity does already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way it's called as the mystery of iniquity for antichrist mystery of iniquity he commits iniquity but he keeps it as a mystery outwardly he is a christian outwardly he is a leader of a christian denomination but he commits mystery he commits iniquity but he tries to conceal it and that's what jesus declared in matthew 7:15 we do have confirmation in the gospels matthew 7:15 let's read this verse beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves ravenous wolves so we'll have to be very careful in terms of identifying the false prophets but jesus had already given us a clue you'll know them by the fruits isn't it you'll know them by their fruits fruits of holy spirit that the entire christian world these days they are trying to focus more on the gifts of the holy spirit gifts of the holy spirit is given for the church not for the individual gifts of the holy spirit matthew 7:21 lord lord we prophesied in your name and we cast out devils in your name jesus says i do not know you we we'll have to focus on the gifts of the we we'll have to focus on the fruits of the holy spirit the nine fruits of the holy spirit galatians 5:22 23 so does the leader of the church is he a loving leader does he have joy pre peace harmony long suffering meekness so if someone doesn't have meekness humbleness long suffering patience so he can't be a christian leader but many times we try to overlook these qualities we say that oh he talks in tongues and he casts out a lot of devils anyone can do that in jesus name but still can lead a life of iniquity 
privately that's why jesus says i do not know you so we'll have to be very careful in terms of identifying these wolves which are actually sitting among the sheep let's look at the next point the antichrist deceives unrighteously the antichrist deceives unrighteously let's read this verse second thessalonians second chapter verse 10 and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved what is the meaning of deceivableness of unrighteousness deceivableness of unrighteousness it means that he commits unrighteousness he is not doing this openly he commits unrighteous activities but he is not doing it openly say for example uh, he'll say that uh, okay jesus is our god but this idol is jesus he'll say that jesus is our god but you can also talk to you can also pray to his mother you can also pray to his relationships brothers sisters apostles he'll say that he'll he commits unrighteous activities but he does it not in an open manner he does it in an unrighteous deceivable manner he conceals this he is an outward christian he is the leader of a fake christian church but he'll he'll be committing iniquity mystery of iniquity he'll try to keep it as a mystery an antichrist is always a liar isn't it first john 222 let's read this verse who is a liar but he that deny that jesus is the christ he is antichrist that deny the father and the son how antichrist is lying from a christian context non christians if you take them they don't accept jesus as the one true god but christian leaders certain cases they openly say that outwardly say that jesus is the one true god but if you look at their actions the private life actions you'll not find the fruits of the holy spirit you'll not fa- have the fruits of the holy spirit they'll be living a life of iniquity they'll be lying to the christian community and the number one ring leader in this group is the pope the ring leader is the pope here we're going to look at a few more identifying characteristics right now we are laying the groundwork just looking at the characteristics of the ant- antichrist let's look at the next point antichrist is a deceiver that's what second john verse number 7 says second john verse number 7 it says this is a deceiver and an antichrist so we have listed about eight points eight clues about the antichrist we need to find out it fits which person all these eight points it fits which person let's do that so these are the eight points we had discussed as of now and the proof the verses are alongside he is outwardly christian antichrist is outwardly christian antichrist is not one man it's a succession of men we had seen this in matthew 24 5 and in the other verses antichrist has the spirit of judas he is a counterfeit he is not a combatant he is not an enemy he is a counterfeit he is an apostle and he has fallen away from the true faith and he is leading a false church his iniquity is kept as mystery it's called as mystery of iniquity he deceives people unrighteously deceivableness of unrighteousness for these two verses you'll have to look at the king james version in the other versions they they are trying to water down the meanings of the words he is a liar 1 john 222 he is a deceiver 2 john verse number 7 and it fits which person it fits the pope exactly to the t it fits to the t let's look at the popes what they do the popes deny jesus by acting as the vicar of christ what is meant by anti look at the true meaning of anti anti means vice like we say vice captain it means vice it means vicar vicar means in the place of it means instead of it means a substitute the vicar of christ means anti christ and this is the title given to the popes this is the title vicar of christ is the title given to the popes and pope implicitly says that i am christ according to the warning given in matthew 24 the popes say that i am christ there are two groups one is false prophets the other one is false christs false christs are the popes false prophets are there in the protestant world the false christs are in the roman catholic world and the false prophets are mainly in the protestant world and let's once again look at this verse matthew 24:5 Jesus says many people will come in my name and they shall say I am Christ 
And what is the number one trick? The number one trick of the Antichrist group is deception. How do you deceive a Christian? You can't deceive a Christian with a Hindu idol. You can't deceive a Christian with Islam doctrine. You can only deceive a Christian by twisting certain verses in the Bible. By simply saying that this particular idol is Jesus. Or we can say that you'll have to tithe. Tithing is a deception. Idol worship in the name of Jesus is again a deception. So like this, there are plenty of uh, twisting and deceptive activities done by these false Christs. And how does the Pope exalt himself above God? Let's have a look at this verse. Second Thessalonians 2nd chapter, verse number 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. And this verse compares nicely with Daniel 11.36. If you look at Daniel 11.36, again, it's a similar verse. And who are the representative of God Almighty on earth? Whom did God keep in the Old Testament? If you look at uh, the Old Testament, God was keeping the judges and the kings for ruling the people. And Pope says, I am under no authority on the world. No one can question me. Everyone is under my authority. You can read scores and scores of encyclicals from the popes. Popes say that I am the king of kings. I am the lord of lords on earth. I am under no authority. Every king has to submit to me. That's why the tiara, that's why the crown had three different decks. The three different decks, the three different crowns, the, the crown had three different decks. And it says that I am the lord of heaven, I am the lord on earth, I am the lord on whatever is beneath the earth. That is how the Pope blasphemes. And Pope, he is the king of Vatican. And he is not ready to relinquish this kingship. Jesus is our king of kings. He always blasphemes Jesus. He always exalts himself above Jesus. And he has a name called as Pontifex Maximus, the high priest. Jesus Christ is our only high priest. If you read through Hebrews, so many different verses are there in Hebrews. Jesus is our only high priest. Popes would deny the high priest office of Jesus. And there are a list of bad popes. I've compiled it. It's not for judging anyone. Now we are told that we need to expose evil. If you look at Ephesians 5.11 in NKGV, it says you'll have to expose evil. And only for this purpose I've listed a small list of bad popes. There was a pope called as Pope Stephen VI. He lived in 896 to 897. He was holding that office, the office of the pope. And this has been taken from Wikipedia itself. Who had his predecessor, Pope Formosus, exhumed, tried, defingered, briefly reburied, and thrown in the Tiber. He took the dead body of the previous Pope, took the dead body, cut all the fingers, and uh, he ran a fake trial and again threw the body in the river. This is how Popes live. This is mystery of iniquity. This is deceivable of deceivableness of unrighteousness. And Pope John the Twelfth. Who had, who gave land to a mistress, murdered several people, was killed by a man who caught him in bed with his wife. This is how adulterous their lives were. So it's just a very small list, and these information were taken from Wikipedia itself. Let me go to the next point. The Pope sits as God in the temple. It's a very important verse. It's a, a big deception. The interpretations of many of the preachers are. Big deceptions these days for this particular verse. Second Thessalonians, second chapter, verse number four. Let's read this verse. He as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He shows himself that he is God. There is one more verse that compares very well with this Daniel eleven thirty six. Let's read these two verses, thirty six and thirty seven. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the end, till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above all, them all. And this person, he does blasphemies. What is blasphemy according to Bible? It is idol worship. Idol worship is the number one blasphemy against Jesus. And what else does he do? He doesn't have any desire for a woman. He doesn't marry a woman. And uh, which is the only denomination which doesn't marry? It is the Roman Catholic denominations. Other small denominations like the CPM, TPM who are living lives like them, they are just daughters, harlot daughters, who are trying to copy the Roman Catholic mother. 
And let's take a look at uh, the next verse, Daniel 11:38. He also does something else. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses, and a god which his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Let me go back to the first verse before explaining this. Let's go back to the first verse, Second Thessalonians, second chapter, verse number four. He as God sits in the temple of God. What is the language in which New Testament is written? It is Greek. Old Testament is written in Hebrew. New Testament is written in Greek. What is the name, Greek name for temple? There are two names in Greek for temple. What are the two names? One is called as Hieron. This is the exact Greek letter, the Greek word for Hieron. It means physical temple. As in when Jesus gets inside the, the Jerusalem temple, this word will be used in the Gospels. And there is one more name for temple in Greek. It's called as the Naos. It means spiritual temple. And let's look at some of the verses in which these, these words were used. In 2 Thessalonians 2nd chapter, verse number 4, which is the current verse, which word is used? It's called as Naos. He will show himself as God in the Naos, the spiritual temple, in the hearts of the people, not in a physical temple. And with this verse, people have twisted the interpretation and in saying that uh, the third Jerusalem temple will be built. There is no verse in Bible which says the third Jerusalem temple will be built because this is a spiritual temple. People regard specifically Roman Catholics, they regard the Pope almost equivalent to God. And uh, they go to Rome just to see the Pope. They go to Rome just to see the Pope and uh, they think that if they see the Pope, if they get his blessings, they will automatically go to heaven. So this kind of a worship they do for the Pope within their hearts, they spend their entire life savings the retirement savings, they spend it uh, within a few days, they go to Rome and come back and everything is gone. Their soul is gone, even their earthly savings is gone. And the word that is being used in some of the verses, let's have a look at the physical temple word here on. This is used in Matthew 4, 5, Matthew 12, 6 and wherever the Jerusalem temple is used. It's called as here on, the physical temple. And wherever the spiritual temple is used, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, you are the temple of God. So wherever the concept of spiritual temple is mentioned, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, even the current verse, 2 Thessalonians 2nd chapter, verse number 4, the word naos is being used. It is the spiritual temple. He doesn't show himself as God in the physical temple. But if you look at this occurrence of the word temple in Revelation, every occurrence of the word temple in Revelation is naos, every word is a spiritual temple, not a single occurrence of physical temple in Revelation. There are many temple words, say for example, Revelation 21, 22. I found no temple in it. Revelation 21, 22, this is Naos. And even the uh, measure the temple, there is one verse in Revelation which says measure the temple and the altar and the believers. Revelation 11, 1. Even this verse, the temple is Naos, it is the spiritual temple. The Jerusalem temple is not going to be rebuilt, it is a deflection strategy. It's a deceptive strategy. They tell the Christians, look at Jerusalem. We shouldn't be looking at Jerusalem, we should be actually looking at Rome. What is happening in Rome? What is happening with the Pope? What is the ecumenical activity happening with the Pope? We should actually look at Rome to understand the end time prophecies. Yes, Jerusalem is important. It will be a stone of trembling. It will be a cup of trembling in the last days, Zechariah 12, 3. Yes, we'll have to look at Jerusalem from the context of uh, the Jerusalem, the people of Israel accepting Jesus. In the context of people accepting Jesus, we can look at Jerusalem and uh, the people of Israel, not in terms of uh, the Antichrist sitting in the Jerusalem temple. And for centuries, how the popes were sitting as God, and these are photographs taken a few years before, Have a look at the three photographs. This is how he gets into the church just a few decades before. Just a few decades before, this is how the Pope would enter the church. He literally fulfilled this prophecy. So he considers himself as God. Look at the number of people, received people. They all consider him as a God and they take him as if he is God. So this is the idols are being taken. 
isn't it? And at least Roman Catholics would know, no, Roman Catholics and even no. Hindus would know, this is how they'll carry the idols. And this is how the Pope was carried a few years before. Whatever you see of the Pope right now, it's all deception. The false humbleness, it's all deception. What about the God of fortresses? He will honor a God of fortresses. Let's look at uh, Daniel 11.38. We had already read this verse, but in their place, he shall honor a God of fortresses. What about the Catholic system, the dead saints, worshipping of dead saints, guardian angels? It is guardian angels and the dead saints. It is a patron saint, God of fortresses, dead saints whom the popes make their protectors, defenders and guardians. They will worship the guardian angels. They have churches for Michael. There are a lot of Michael churches, isn't it? A lot of churches named in the name of man. And this is the God of fortresses. And let's look at the next point. Popes rose when the hindrance was removed. This is one more massive misinterpretation in the Christian world. And let's look at this verse. Let's read the two verses, Second Thessalonians, second chapter, verses six and seven. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Many preachers preach this restrainer as the Holy Spirit. But the first question is, how is Paul referring to Holy Spirit in the entire Bible? In all his epistles, how is Paul talking about Holy Spirit? He always says it is either the ghost or the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit or the Spirit. He always uses these words, either the Spirit or Holy Spirit or ghost or Holy Ghost. This is how Apostle Paul refers to the Holy Ghost. But who it is referring to? It is obviously not the Holy Spirit. Because it is mentioned in a singular tone in some of the Indian translations. Not with a respectful language. This he is not with a respectful tone in some of the Indian translation. Who is this he? Obviously not the Holy Spirit. It is the Caesar, the restrainer in Rome. Who was the restrainer in Rome? Antichrist has to always come from Rome. Who was there before, before the Antichrist? Who was before the Pope? It was the Caesar. Only when the Caesar is killed, finally when the last Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustulus, when he was killed in 476 AD, Pope started to grow. The little horn started to grow. Now, can you understand how the horn grows for, a, for, for any other kind of cattle? The horn grows very, very slowly. Similar to that, this little horn was growing silently for about 50 years, 476 AD. Europe got divided into 10 different countries and the horn was growing about 50 years, 538 AD. Justinian Emperor, he gave the primacy to this guy, Pope. He said he is the leader of the entire Christian world. So this restrainer is not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not going to come, go out of the world. People say that when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the world, you will have the rapture and the Antichrist will be revealed. What a false prophecy, what a false interpretation. He said, I will be with you till the end of the world, isn't it? Matthew 28, 20. I'll be with you till the last days. Now, how is the Holy Spirit going to go out of the world? He created the world. He's always going to be with the world. He's always going to be with his people, with his children. So the hindrance, when was it removed? The he. The he refers to the Caesar, emperor of the Roman Empire. When was he removed? He was removed, and this interpretation is not my own interpretation. Irenaeus. We need to understand about this guy. Irenaeus, he lived, he died in 202. And he is a disciple of Polycarp. Who was Polycarp? He was a disciple of Apostle John. They had direct information from Apostle John. Irenaeus, he was a disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of Apostle John. And Apostle John had conveyed certain things to Polycarp, which he conveyed to Irenaeus. And we still have the writings of Irenaeus. We still have the old manuscripts written by Irenaeus. And Irenaeus, he has clearly mentioned that Antichrist has to come from Rome. Unless the Caesar is removed from Rome, unless the hindrance is removed from Rome, unless the restrainer is removed from Rome, the Antichrist can't be revealed. And the restrainer, the hindrance is the Caesar. But why is Paul not writing a Caesar? That's the main question. Why is he writing in an implicit way? Because if he had mentioned that Caesar will be removed from Rome, He'll immediately send an army and kill the people of Thessalonica, isn't it? Are you saying that I'll be removed after a few years? He is a big king, Caesar. 
so he is going to kill the people of thessalonica that's why paul is implicitly subtly reminding that i've told you uh, while i was living with you he is simply reminding the people about his earlier conversation so the hindrance as and when it was removed in 476 ad justinian emperor he gave the popal the papal primacy to the popes the pope is clearly the antichrist but it's not just the pope alone it is a system it is a system and under the name of ecumenism all the protestant churches are uniting under the pope in the name of ecumenism it is a harlot body we should be united with the body of jesus not with the harlot's body but these days the the protestant churches there is an organization called as the world council of churches this organization right from 1948 right from israel became a nation again in 1948 this particular organization it is trying to join all the protestant churches with the catholic church and it is protestant churches along with the main guy the pope and jesus says you come out in second corinthians 6 chapter verse number 17 as well as in revelation 18:4 in two different places jesus says come out will have to be separate we shouldn't be united with the harlot's body we can go through all these joint declarations done by the protestant churches and the catholic churches how they are hand in hand always thieves will be hand in hand isn't it thick as thieves we say thieves will be hand in hand with each other so the conclusion here is the antichrist is a christian antichrist is a christian system not a single guy he's not going to come in the future he's already there he is going to persecute the christians for about 1260 years not 1260 days the entire book of revelation being fulfilled in about 3 and a half years no one can imagine that there are a lot of prophecies to be fulfilled and all these prophecies can't be fulfilled in just 1260 days it has to take many years in fact hundreds and hundreds of years and in fact most of the revelation prophecies have already been fulfilled most of the revelation prophecies so if we say that revelation is going to be fulfilled in the future are we saying that jesus had forsaken us it is equivalent to saying that jesus had forsaken us if there is no prophecy that has been fulfilled in the last 2000 years it is saying that jesus has forsaken his people jesus will never forsake his children we always have a map we always have a guide just like the jews look at the book of daniel the book of daniel was an excellent book to trace in which year jesus will be revealed to the world there is a 70 week prophecy which we'll be looking at in the afternoon so using that particular prophecy the people of israel they could have easily decoded in which year in exactly which year jesus will show himself as a messiah there is a timeline prophecy similarly there is a prophecy a map available in revelation till the end of days till the second coming of jesus so it is a slow historical fulfillment of prophecies like we see in daniel so daniel we can see the fulfillment in history similarly revelation we can see the fulfillment in history so if anyone is watching the video if you are a catholic if you are an ecumenical protestant you will have to come out of babylon so with this we complete this topic